want to talk to us about the truth about adoption. Now, when I title a message, The Truth About Something, I do so because a lot of people hold a lot of misconceptions about that subject. I'm not saying I'm the only person that knows the truth, but I'm helping you to understand the truth about it, okay? Amen. The truth about adoption. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 14, reading simply through verse 17. The King James text today reads, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Amen. Romans 8, 14 through 17. The truth about adoption. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. King Jesus, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for the presence of the Lord as we sing the songs, the great songs of the church today. We have blessed assurance that Jesus is ours. And Master, today we also celebrate the faithfulness of our God. Hallelujah. As the psalmist David declared, I am old, I've been young, now I'm old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Master, you're faithful and we're grateful for this. The word of God must go forth. And Lord, trials and tribulations and struggles would come against my soul today and would attempt, Lord, to hinder the word of God. But Master, I know the power of the anointing. I know the ability of the anointing to break the yoke and to break every chain. And Master, right now, God, I ask that you would anoint me as the speaker, the deliverer of your word, and anoint the ear of every hearer. Those watching live, listening live, those who will watch later, even many much later, by reason of the internet, let the anointing of the Holy Ghost touch their heart and bear witness with their spirit that the Word of God is being delivered to them for the benefit of their soul. Lead us, O God, in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Help us to attain higher heights and deeper depths than you by reason of your engrafted word. For we ask it today in none other than Jesus' precious sacred name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Born again children of God are said to have been adopted into the family of God. The Apostle Paul makes it clear, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Hallelujah. He said, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are presently the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs, with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. I want to tell you today, we have been adopted into the family of God. The Holy Spirit is given as a down payment or an earnest payment toward our ultimate physical redemption. Many 
in the church world have for many, many years, many decades, possibly even centuries, misrepresented what it means to have been adopted into the family of God. For the Apostle Paul declares in Romans 8 and 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We have not been made servants. Oh my Lord, I hope you're hearing me now. We have not been made servants. He said we have not received the spirit of bondage. We are not bound to God by reason of master servant servitude. He said, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Hallelujah. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father, hallelujah, by reason of the Holy Ghost, as God's down payment on our redemption, we are able to cry out to God and call Him our Father. And we have become His sons, His daughters, His children. In Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, the Word of God tells us, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, meaning down payment, of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. You'll notice in Ephesians 1, the Holy Spirit is given to believers. Listen to what Paul said. After we believe... My Baptist friends will try to tell you that the Holy Ghost is given you when you believe. No, no, no. That's not the truth. Paul said to those he found on the coast of Ephesus, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? He then says in Ephesians chapter 1, And verse 13, in whom ye also trusted, speaking of Jesus, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the Holy Ghost is a transaction that takes place after we have believed the gospel. My Lord, have mercy. The Holy Spirit is given to believers after we believe as an earnest payment or a down payment on a promised transaction which is yet to come. The day is coming in the which the Lord will make good on His promise and He will retrieve His purchased possession. What is that purchased possession? His adopted family. Until that time, some things have changed in us. Some things have changed for us. And listen to me now, children. While other things have not changed at all. We must yet live in a sinful world. We must yet live captive to a flesh and blood body which subjects us to sin and failure, weaknesses, and faults. We look forward to the day when our redemption is complete and we are no longer bound by the constraints of a flesh and blood mortal existence. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul writes, For we that are in this tabernacle or in this flesh and blood body do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. In other words, he said, we don't simply want to put off our body. He said, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up 
of life. In other words, he says, we're not simply going to put off our body and our body no longer will exist and we no longer have any use for our body. He said, no, 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 no. He said, rather, that we be changed, that our body be changed, so that we be clothed in a different manner and in a different way, rather than in flesh and blood, that we might be clothed with a spiritual existence and a spiritual body. Listen, the Apostle Paul says, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. So once again, he makes reference to the Holy Ghost being given as a down payment, as it were, on our ultimate redemption. Now until the divine transaction is complete, and the purchased possession is retrieved or redeemed by the purchaser, that being the Lord Jesus Christ himself, we are in a constant cycle of spiritual struggle as our spiritual man strives to reign supreme and our body resists being subject to our spirit. Do you know what I'm talking about? Am I the only one that goes through that? In my spirit, I want to live right. I want to talk right. I want to act right and do right. And yet my body says, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to let you make the rules. I'm going to do things the way I want to do things. And every once in a while, your mouth runs off. Every once in a while, you do something you ought not to have done. Every once in a while, you say something you ought not to have said. Because our spirit and our flesh are constantly in a struggle when this body is finally one day put off this struggle for us will be ended hallelujah see that's the struggle we know today excuse me but that is not a struggle that we're going to have to deal with forever because when we finally are able to put this body off and put on the divinely prepared body that God has created for us, the spiritual man, otherwise known as a living soul, when that day finally comes, then the struggle between the flesh and the spirit will no longer exist. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 55, the Apostle Paul writes, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Hallelujah. But until that day of redemption, we live the same struggle described by the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, 14 through 25. Paul writes, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. 
For I know that in me, Paul writes in parentheses, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. In other words, the desire in me is to do the right thing. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Anybody identify with what he's saying so far? Mm -hmm. Now if I do that, I would not. If I do that which I wouldn't do, that I don't want to do, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, in my body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members or in my body. O oh, wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul's talking about that contradiction. He's talking about that battle, that war that exists between our flesh and our spiritual man. He said, you know, I belong to God. I'm God's. I know the right thing to do. I desire to do the right thing. And yet without fail, I find myself doing the wrong thing. He said, I know the wrong thing, and I don't want to do the wrong thing, but by heavens, every time I turn around, I find myself doing the very thing I don't want to do. Hello now. Oh, I know that struggle. I'll tell you, I'm not going to lie to you and act like I don't understand that struggle. Listen, adoption does not change our natural, hereditary, inherited traits. When a child is adopted, there are many things he's going to bring with him that come from his natural parents. It don't matter who's adopted him. It don't matter how good they are, how kind they are, how sweet they are, how healthy they are, how pure they are, how wonderful their bloodline is. If that child is from a family where mental health issues, for instance, might be prominent, that child may inherit some of those things. And those issues are going to come into that new family whether they want them or not. Because they come with the kid. Because even though the child's been adopted, there are still those things which follow. Hello now. Got news for you children. Those preachers and those teachers and those false prophets who get up in the church and tell you that because you're adopted, because you've received the gift of the Holy Ghost, the down payment, the earth this payment from God on your eventual uh, redemption that all of a sudden you're different and you don't do the things you used to do and you don't have traits you used to have and all of a sudden you're Mr. and Mrs. Perfect and you walk in this glorious world they are full of baloney that is not true the Apostle Paul said no 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 the, the things that come with being in the natural body remain Guess what one of those things is? Sin. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Oh, but we got holiness preachers tell us, bless God, you can live sinless, glory to God. You can live above sin. You're full of garbage. You're full of garbage. I'm going to tell you something. Everybody comes to church and acts on their, their best behavior. Everybody comes to church, puts their best foot forward. Even the preacher does. Everybody comes to church, but I, you know, I believe when we're in the house of God, in many ways, we are our most authentic selves. We really are. What you see in church is often more what that person wants to be, am I telling the truth, mm -hmm. 
than what they are. Because when they leave the church, then their spirit is not able to reign supreme. You see, that's one of the reasons why coming into the house of God is so important. Because when we come into the house of God, when we come into the fellowship of the saints, we're able to be our authentic selves. We're actually able to live and be for that time what we desire to live and be always. Am I telling the truth? You see, people love to sit back and call Christians uh, uh, hypocrites. Oh, he's such a hypocrite. Goes to church and acts this way and then goes home and acts another way. may not be that they're a hypocrite at all. No, when they're in church, bless God, they don't have the same things pressing up against them and trying them and the same struggles and the same tests that come against them every day in their natural life. And because they don't, and they've set those things aside and they've walked away from those things for a while, they're able to come into the house of God and they're able to be in the house of God what they wish they could be always. Am I telling the truth? I don't know about you, but that's how yeah, I feel. Me too. Man, I'll tell you, I wish I could be in the world the same way I am in the church all the time. But there are times in the world when things, and I'm going to tell you, uh, the way I grew up and things I grew up with, just like you folks, ain't one of you listening to me now that you can sit there and deny it till the cows come home and don't change the facts. You carry a lot of baggage and a lot of luggage with you from your youth. You, you carry a lot of baggage with you from your growing up. You went through a lot of stuff. You know, some of us are much more uh, sensitive than others. Some of us respond more violently or more angrily to things. It's not because we're an angry, nasty person. It's because we've been hurt like a hurt dog. You come after us in a certain way, we're going to bark or we're going to growl or we're going to bite. You know what I'm telling you? There's an old saying that says hurt people hurt people. Mm-hmm got news for you. Just because you're adopted into the family of God, it does not change what you bring in, you're adopted. You don't all of a sudden become your adopted mom and dad's natural born child. You become their child legally. Am I telling the truth? On paper, emotionally, psychologically, for all practical purposes, you are in fact their child. But you're still bringing things in with you as an adopted child that don't come from them, that come from before them. Oh my Lord, do you hear what I'm telling you now? So adoption does not change hereditary or inherited traits. It changes our status. It changes our relationship. We no longer have the parent or parents that we once had. If you're a child who's gone through the system, if you've gone through the foster care system and then someone adopts you, well, you had parents before them, but they mistreated you, they abused you, they abandoned you, whatever the case might be. So you no longer have them as your parents. You now have new parents. Or in the case of an orphan child, we no longer are without a parent or parents. We now have a parent. But God's relationship to us has changed by reason of our adoption. And our relationship to God has changed by reason of His adopting us. He now views us and has taken responsibility for us as a legal, legitimate parent. Hallelujah, aren't you glad as a child of God that God has taken responsibility for you. Mm -hmm. Woo. Think about it for a minute. God has taken responsibility for you. That's why the Word of God tells us, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. And I've told you, that's not talking about emotion. You know, He cares for you. No, 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 no. 
He says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you, meaning he is your caregiver. He is your caretaker. A parent is your caretaker. The reason we can cast all our troubles and our burdens on the Lord is because he is our father. He's adopted us. He has taken responsibility for us. He is our caregiver, our caretaker. My Lord, have mercy. The Lord sees us now as His children. We are now to see ourselves as the children of the Almighty. But we still are going to possess qualities which we come by quite naturally. You can change the nature and status of your relationship to God by reason of adoption. And the law recognizes this change. But you are still, in effect, the offspring of your natural parents. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? If there are health issues, personality traits, or inherited attributes which you share with your natural parents, they will remain with you. Many people who adopt children later in life have to deal with any number of issues which are directly related to the natural parents of that adopted child. While some things, some behaviors and characteristics may be learned, many things are innate. We can learn to be like our adopted parents in many ways through observation and emulation, but there will be things which we cannot change as they are part of our DNA. Thus, the reason, listen to me children, that we must one day be Changed. Why are we waiting for redemption? Why are we waiting for the Lord to come so this mortal can put on immortality and this corruptible can put on incorruption? Why are we waiting for that day and that time? Why is that transaction even necessary? If God's changed us at adoption, if we've genuinely been fully and completely changed at the time of our adoption, then why is yet another change necessary? Because the change that that is coming is what's going to separate us from our inherited traits, our inherent traits. You hear what I'm telling you now? It's going to separate us from those things which we have no control over. See, one good thing about the spiritual man, the spiritual man can be in control of the spiritual man. Oh my goodness. This is why the Word of God said in the Garden of Eden, God created Adam and Eve as living souls. Living souls. And when they believed the serpent, rather than believing God and trusting what God had warned them and what the Lord had told them, their nature changed. They suddenly took on a fallen, sinful nature. And that is why every human being who is ever born into a human flesh and blood body is fallen before they ever take their first step. There is no such thing as a child being born pure and sinless. No, 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 no. When you're born into a human flesh and blood body, my friend, you are born fallen. The Word of God said, I was shaped in sin. I was formed in iniquity. And before you're ever born, you already are in the process of being formed into a sinful creature. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And it isn't going to be. God adopts sinful creatures who bring that sinful nature yet with them because they haven't changed. But the day is coming when it will. Oh my goodness. Listen, this is it. I'm talking about the truth about adoption. While we are adopted, one day we shall become, listen to me children, adapted. I want to repeat that. Listen carefully. While today we are adopted on that bright and cloudless morning, as the old hymn says, 
when the dead in Christ shall rise, we shall be adapted, changed. We shall be like Him. We shall be adapted to His nature. Hallelujah! This is one adoption, listen to me now, that will one day end in adaptation. Hallelujah! We're adopted today with the promise that we will wind up looking like our adopted daddy. We will wind up acting like our adopted daddy. We will one day wind up being just like our adopted daddy. Oh, hallelujah! And there will be nothing that comes from mom or dad that's coming with us. Glory to God! Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Woo! Glory! Think about it for a minute. How exciting is that? God says, I've adopted you, and I'm giving you the Holy Ghost as a down payment on that adoption. Oh, but listen, <laughs> here's how this adoption works. The day is coming when you're going to go from adoption to adaption, hallelujah, to adaptation. There's a day coming when you're no longer going to be my child in spirit, but a child of the world in the flesh. No, the day is coming when I'm going to take that flesh and I'm going to change it. And you're going to be a walking, living soul as Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. And you'll be adapted into my likeness. You'll be like me. Oh, hallelujah. So our adopted daddy is going to become our legitimate daddy. Oh my goodness, who can do this but God? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Who can do this but God? Oh, I want to tell you today, children, the Word of God tells us in Romans 8, same chapter as our primary text, go down a few verses to verses 19 through 23. The Apostle Paul writes, For the earnest expectation of the creature, meaning the creation, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature of the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature or the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Listen to the terminology. Waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So Paul's saying the adoption is going to be made complete when our body has been changed. But we will not merely be adopted as one adopts in this world, but we will literally be changed and caused to become the literal sons and daughters of God. And we shall be like Him. Hallelujah. What does the Word of God say concerning Adam and Eve? And God created man, what? In His own image. When you look at human beings today and you say, oh, that person is made in the image of God. No, they're not. No, they're not. Their spiritual man is not their flesh and blood man. Their flesh and blood man is the byproduct of Adam's fall. Don't you blame God for that. Don't you blame God for some sicko who's born with mental issues because of his parentage and he runs around molesting and raping and murdering and killing? Don't you blame God for that? That's not God's image. Don't you ever try to make that into God's image. That doesn't have nothing to do with God. That is strictly the byproduct of fallen man. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? No, the Word of God said men are made after, listen, the way Paul worded, he said, after the similitude of God. Meaning what? Similar to. Not the same. 
similar to how is that man is made a spiritual being we have a life that goes beyond our body we have a spirit what is God God is a spirit hello now God created Adam and Eve how he made them the word of God said God breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam became a living soul What's going to happen for believers when they're resurrected from their graves and when the saints of God that are alive and remain are caught up together to meet them in the air? The Bible said we shall be changed. What are we going to be changed into? Living souls. Hallelujah. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But in the soul that believes and trusts God for salvation and obeys this great gospel is going to live forever. Say, yeah, well, but if their soul dies, those people in hell, then they're gone. They're finished. They're kaput. It's all done for them. No, it's not. Because man is not body and soul. Man is body, soul, and spirit. When Jesus went to, the, to hell, according to the word of God, during his three days in the grave, what does the scripture tell us? It says he preached unto the spirits which were in prison. He didn't preach to souls. No, he preached to the spirits that are in prison. If there's any mistake the church has made, it is trying to make every human being uh, to claim that every human being has an immortal soul. No, every human being does not have an immortal soul. The only immortal souls are going to be those of believers. But, the spirits of those who have not believed, the spirit of those who have rejected Christ and this great gospel are going to wind up in the devil's hell. Satan and his angels are spirits. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? They're going to wind up in hell. Spirits are going to be housed in hell. Living souls, the only souls that live, are those who have had the new life of the born-again experience breathed into them by the Holy Ghost. Those souls are going to be living for, forever in the presence of God. I love that old song we used to sing. Tis a glad and glorious thought that comes to me. I'll live on. Yes, I'll live on. Jesus saved my soul from death and now I'm free. I'll live on. Yes, I'll live on. I'll live on. Yes, I'll live on. Through eternity, I'll live on. I'll live on. Yes, I'll live on. Through eternity, I'll live on. The born again experience, listen, begins with a spiritual transaction, but it ends with a physical transformation. Our spiritual man today dons a natural physical form, but the day is coming when our natural form shall be exchanged for a spiritual form. And that spiritual form shall perfectly match, listen, our inward man, which has been adopted by the Savior. Hallelujah. In John 3, 5 through 6, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Meaning what? Meaning the born again experience in this life is a spiritual experience. It is a spiritual transaction. 1 John 3 and 2 Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is Hallelujah the Lord understands there are aspects of who we are which are the byproduct of our natural birth. He is aware that we cannot in this life 
fully be like Him. We strive to be like Him because when you love Daddy, you want to act like Daddy. You want to be like Daddy. Thus, He has made arrangements today to adopt us spiritually. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. <laughs> Listen, when that guy adopted me, I followed him everywhere. Why? Because he was my daddy. Hello now. That kid, that adopted child is going to follow his daddy around just like a natural born child would follow their daddy. Am I telling the truth? And if the natural born daddy does all kind of evil and ungodly and wicked things, that child's going to learn to do all kinds of wicked and evil and ungodly things. But if we're led by the Spirit of God, well, the Spirit of God is our daddy. Hello now. That's our Father. If we're led by the Spirit of God, that means we're following in our Father's footsteps. And we're trying to act like Him. We're trying to behave like Him. We're trying to be like Him. But that doesn't change what we inherited at birth. Oh my goodness. Have you ever thought about adoption into the family of God in these terms? The Lord has made arrangements today to adopt us spiritually. But this adoption is only meant to assure us of the opportunity to be adapted later. One day, our adoption will become adaptation. And we shall be like Him. Hallelujah. Revelation in closing. Revelation 21, 5 through 7. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, to John, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Inherit all things. Who inherits? A child inherits. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, I want to tell you today, children, the truth about adoption is simple. We're adopted by God into His family in this life, but that doesn't change a lot of things that we carry with us. But God has promised one day that our adoption will become adaptation. And He's going to change us so that we legitimately, literally become once again the sons and daughters and children of God. And the only way that's possible is for us to become like Him. For us to become, God made man in His own image and He made Adam, what? A living soul. We will become living souls. Hallelujah. The, the, we will become a soul that will live forever in the presence of God and as such we will be his children and he will be our God hallelujah that's the truth about adoption praise the name of the Lord which is standing with me this afternoon praise